to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ Welcome to the Gospel of Christ program. My name is Ben Bailey, and we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. Those members of the Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly. If you've got a Bible question or there's something you'd like to study, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God together with you. Also, at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. You can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and all our Bible study material is free of charge and available to you. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, whether on DVD or CD, we'd love to send that to you. You can fill out a media request form from our website, or you can call us toll-free at one 855 458-3905. On our website, we have a host of Bible study material, including transcripts, study question, question and answers, and a variety of study materials that would help you in your study of the Word of God. Friend, at the Gospel of Christ, we're concerned about the salvation of souls. That's our main emphasis. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about hidden agendas. We just simply want to help men and women know the Word of God and to go to heaven. And so as we transition to our study today, we hope that you'll get your Bible out and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God together. To the church in Ephesus, as it related to their worship, the Apostle Paul said, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 19. Welcome to our study of fundamentals of the faith. Today we think about the fundamental subject as it relates to worship and Christian singing. What does God want in singing? What does God want in music? Does God want a, a large band? Does He want lights and a show and fog and smoke and all that stuff? Is God looking for an organ or piano or somebody who plays a guitar? What about singing as we read in the Bible? And more importantly, what does the Scripture say? Romans chapter 4, verse number 3. And so today we're going to be thinking about the fundamental subject of singing and whether or not God asks for mechanical instruments of music in the New Testament. Friend, from the outset, we want to recognize that our authority in worship today is from the words of the New Testament. The New Testament clearly teaches we must do that which God has asked us to do and that which is authorized in the New Testament. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18, All authority has been given to me in heaven, and on earth. And so from the outset we ask the question, who is it that has all authority as it relates to worship and as it relates to singing today? And friend, the answer is Jesus Christ. Whatever Christ wants us to do, that's what we must do. We must follow His words and His guidance because He, not me and you, not somebody in some other part of the world, not some religious leader somewhere, Christ has all authority. He is the head of the church, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, and that head has not been decapitated. He is reigning from heaven itself. Psalm 119, verse 89, and Hebrews 1, verses 3 and 4. As we think about following Christ's teaching and following His authority in worship, there was a great statement made that I hope you'll think about with me from John 2 verse 5. Jesus' mother, when she realizes Jesus is going to perform the miracle of turning the water to wine, she looks at the servants and here's what she says, whatever He, Jesus says to you, do it. 
Friend, as we think about worship, as we think about living for Christ, could you find a better motto than that? Whatever, if He has all authority and He's head of the church, whatever Jesus says to us, we want to do that. Colossians 3 verse 17 says, Whatever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. In word, what I speak, in deed, in my actions, everything I do must be done in the name of, which means by the authority of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's a passage I want to remind you of as we think about Bible authority that is so important. And, and I want you to notice this one with me. It comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And Paul has been teaching the church at Corinth to put their trust in God and to follow His Word. And, and God will eventually give the increase. And you'll notice 1 Corinthians 4 verse 6. Paul uses this kind of to illustrate what he's saying. He says, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sake. Now here's the lesson though. That you may learn in us don't miss this, not to think beyond what's written. Friend, as we think today about a subject that may be new, maybe an idea you've not heard, maybe is even an idea that you have some questions about, here's all that we ask. Let's let Jesus be the final authority. Let's take Christ at His Word. Let's put our faith in Him. And remember 1 Corinthians 4 verse 6, don't think beyond what's written. Somebody says, well, the Bible doesn't say not to. No, I don't think beyond what's written. If God has defined how He wants us to worship within the pages of this book, let's stay within the pages of God's revealed will. That's the safe way. Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19, the Scripture says we're not to add to nor take away from the Word of God. If God asks us what to do, that's what He wants us to do. He doesn't want us to go beyond that. He doesn't want us to take away from what He said. And He doesn't want us to add to and put our ideas in it. Proverbs 30 verse 6, the writer said, Do not add to God's Word, lest He rebuke you, and you be found a liar. Now friend, as we think today about this idea of Bible authority, it's also essential for us to realize that God's law in the New Testament is our authority today. In the Bible, there are two major divisions. There's the Old Testament, which is Genesis through Malachi. And then there is the New Testament, which is Matthew through Revelation. Which law are Christians going to be judged by today? As I read the Bible, Colossians 2 verse 14 and Ephesians 2 verse 14 clearly teaches that the Old Testament law, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, was nailed to the cross and that wall was broken down between Jew and Gentile. And thus the old law, Romans 7 verses 1 through 4, which said, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not covet, Romans 7 verses 1 through 4. Christians are dead, the Bible says, to that law. That law was written to the people of Israel. It is a law that I cannot break, nor can I keep, because it's not written, nor does it apply to me. For example, I'm a citizen of the United States of America. Can I break or keep the laws of Canada right here living in the United States? Nope, those laws don't apply to me. I'm not a citizen of Canada and their laws have no effect or bearing on me while I'm right here in the United States. Friend, the same is true for Christianity. I'm not living in Old Testament Israel's time. I'm not under that law. I'm not following the teaching of Moses. But here's what the Bible does say. The Bible clearly teaches our authority is the New Testament. Do you remember John chapter 12, verse number 48? Jesus said, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. Well, what is it? The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day, beginning with the words of Christ and following that through the New Testament to the very last revealed word in the book of Revelation. That's the law Christians are under today. It's the perfect law of liberty. James chapter 1, verse number 25. And, you know, as we think about following God's law, just in basic principle, 
let's realize that God has always expected His people to do what He says without adding to, without taking away. God just simply wants us to obey His will. Now, let me give you a couple of examples of that. Just in general from the Bible, the principle that God wants us to follow His law regardless of who He's speaking to is seen throughout the ages. Uh, Leviticus chapter 10 might be an example. I want you to notice what happens in this context. Leviticus chapter 10 in verses 1 and 2, we learn the basic principle of following exactly what God says. The Bible says, beginning in verse 1, Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer, put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which He had not commanded them. And the Bible says, So fire went out from the presence of the Lord, and, they, and the Lord devoured them, and they died before the Lord that day. What exactly happened in this context? They offered a strange, or some versions will say, an unauthorized fire, which God had not commanded them. Well, God hadn't asked for it, but they thought, well, we might do it anyway. How, how did God feel about that? Friend, you'll recognize very well God was not happy with that. Fire rained down from heaven and devoured those two men. Why? They did something God had not commanded. That which was not asked for, that which was not authorized. And so the basic principle I learn is God wants men and women under the law they're living under to do what He says. Let me give you another example. You read in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6, the events that go on there with uh, David bringing the ark back. In 2 Samuel 6, you've got two men, uh, Uzzah and Ohio, driving the ark, and they're bringing that ark back on a new cart. And as they reach a place called Nashon's threshing floor, the ark hits what we might think of as a pothole in essence, a bump in the road, and the ark looks like it's going to tip over. And so Uzzah, because he loves God and he recognizes the importance of the ark, he reaches out to stabilize it. The moment he touches that ark, he drops dead. Trying to do the right thing, it looks like. Trying to protect the ark, he drops dead right there. David doesn't know why. The people really aren't sure why. And so he begins to get a little angry. What's going on here? Why did this happen? We thought this is what God wanted us to do. And then we get the rest of the story, which again illustrates that God wants men and women to follow exactly what He says. You'll notice from 1 Chronicles chapter 15, there's an update on why these events happened to Uzzah. Listen to the scripture in 1 Chronicles 15 verse 13. Concerning the event where Uzzah touched the ark, David said, For because you did not do it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult Him about the proper order. So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel, and the children of the Levites bore the ark of God on their shoulders by its poles, listen now, as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. What went wrong in 2 Samuel 6? There wasn't to be a new cart. Uzzah and Ahio had no right to bring that back. God had told His people way back in the book of Numbers, there's rings on the side of the ark. You run poles through that. You don't ever touch it. You run poles through it. And then the Levites were to bear the ark by those poles placed on four of the Levites' shoulders, one on each side. And so David said, and these are the words we want you to listen real carefully to, God's wrath broke out against us, listen now, because we did not consult Him about the proper order. Friend, things always go south as it relates to Bible authority. When we stop consulting God and put men's ideas, men's feelings, what some religious leader somewhere says is the best thing we ought to do. And so we spend a great deal of time talking about Bible authority because it's such a fundamental idea to understanding how to receive God's message and how it is God wants us to respect His authority. God wants me in the New Testament just simply to do what He says. Don't add to, don't take away, don't say, well, it seems like we ought to do this or this would make a lot of people happier. Just do what He says. John chapter 2, what Jesus says to you, do it. John chapter 2, verse number 5. And so let's think for a few moments about what the New Testament does say concerning singing. And we'll be looking at a few passages, so I hope you've got your Bible handy as we think about 
how does the New Testament, what does Jesus say, what do His disciples teach, the Holy Spirit teach in the New Testament about singing? Acts chapter 16, verse number 25, we learn what Paul and Silas were doing. The Bible says, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. What were these Christians doing? They were singing hymns to God. Very simple, very plain. That's what we find in their example. Another passage, Romans chapter 15. In verse number 9, we have these words recorded about singing in the New Testament. The Scripture says in verse 9, And that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy, as it is written, For this reason I will confess to you among the Gentiles, and sing to your name. So, Paul and Silas were singing. Here God says they're to sing to your name in the Scriptures. And so, so far we see singing. Then we come to 1 Corinthians 14, verse number 15. And we learn a great lesson about singing here. The Bible says, I will sing with the Spirit and I'll sing with the understanding. How am I to do, what am I to do, first of all? I'm to sing. How do I do that? With the Spirit, that's my inner being, that's my emotion, that's heartfelt, generated by love, motivated by appreciation for God with thankfulness. I'll sing with the Spirit and with understanding. Am I to just mouth some words that I have no clue what they mean? Of course not. I'm to sing with the Spirit and with the understanding. Now, two passages especially that we want to direct your attention to. Would you look in Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 19. What else do we know about singing as it relates to the corporate worship in the assembly of the saints? Look in Ephesians 5, verse number 19. We are to be speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart, to the Lord. What specifically are we to do? Speak to one another. We're to teach and admonish one another. We're to sing and make melody where? Not on a piano, not on an organ, not on a guitar, not on a big rock band, not with smoke and lights and fall. That's not what God asked for. Sing and make melody in your heart goes hand in hand with 1 Corinthians 14, 15. I'll sing with the Spirit, and I'll sing with the understanding. What is it God wants me to use to make melody? The heart. Do I use the voice to speak? There's no doubt you do. But our heart, it's not some, some rote words that we say that we have no clue, we just utter, we don't know what they mean. True singing is motivated from the heart. We sing and make melody out of appreciation from our heart to God. Who's asked us to do that? But again, you'll notice, speaking, singing, making melody in your heart. No mention anywhere so far of mechanical instruments of music. Look in Colossians chapter 3, and I want you to notice what Paul says to the church in Colossae here. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 16, the apostle Paul says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. What does Paul tell the church in Colossae to do? To teach, to admonish one another. Well, Paul, how do you want us to do that? Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart, uh, teaching one another, and doing that, again, unto the Lord. We're to teach, sing, speak, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Those are the, the content of what we may use. Uh, we may sing one of the psalms found in the Old Testament. Uh, hymns that some have written based on Scripture. Spiritual related songs. All of those would be acceptable to God in their content. But we do that again by teaching with the voice, by admonishing and we speak one unto another. The reciprocal idea of all singing together is surely found in these words. Another passage that we find in the New Testament, and we just kind of want to emphasize these. Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 12, the Bible records these words. God is seen as saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. Listen now, in the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. James 5, verse 13, If anyone's happy, 
let him sing psalms. Matthew 26, verse 30. Jesus and his disciples sang a hymn and went out. Now, we ask you this. If we have thought about the verses in the New Testament related to singing for Christians in the church here on earth, here's what we've seen. Sing, speak to one another, teach one another, admonish one another, sing and make melody in your heart all over and over again. The idea is that of singing. It's not playing. It's not picking. It's not lowing on some kind of instrument, a flute or playing on a harp. You don't find that in the Bible. God's asked me and you to use our voice, to use the heart, to make melody unto Him that which is supreme to anything that man himself might make. And friend, this is a, a very important part of worship. John 4 verse 24, Jesus said, God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. If I'm to worship God in spirit and based on truth, can I worship God with a mechanical instrument of music when that's not what God asked me to do for the law I'm living under in the New Testament day and age? Now friend, as we think about why it is the case that Christians do not use instrumental music today, we want to again remind you of these principles. Why don't we use mechanical instruments of music today? There's no authority for it. God has told us what to use and there's no guidance in the New Testament ever given on using mechanical instruments of music. Colossians 3.17 We do all by the authority of Christ. What has Christ authorized us to do? We don't add to, nor do we take away from the words found in the New Testament. Can you use a mechanical instrument without adding something to the teaching of the New Testament? They're not found in there. They're not mentioned specifically in Scripture, and thus you would have to be adding to to do that. And let me mention this as well. Even many, by many we mean a good host. Even many denominational leaders recognize that instruments of music, mechanical instruments of music, were not authorized uh, by Almighty God. Uh, let me give you just a few that would say this. For example, those would be, and going all the way back in, in history, Pope Vitalis himself was the first to introduce them, but even then they weren't accepted for over 1,200 years. Thomas Aquinas wrote, as he spoke to the Roman Catholic Church, he wrote, The church does not use musical instruments such as the harp or the lyre when praising God in case she should seem to fall back into Judaism. For musical instruments usually move the soul more to pleasure than to create moral goodness. As far back as the year 416, the Council of Carthage addressed the issue of instruments of music and declared on the Lord's Day, let all instruments of music be silenced. You can look at leaders uh, like uh, Charles Spurgeon. You can look at leaders like those who established many religious groups today, John Wesley, Martin Luther, and many of those will say instruments of music weren't authorized by God Himself. And so as we think about this, let's realize that instruments, they don't teach and they don't admonish with words as we are taught and as we learn today. That's not something God has authorized in the Scripture. Now friend, while we do think about using uh, our voices in song to God and that being which God has authorized us to use, since that is the case, let me mention a few things that are so important to do that effectively and to do that in a way that God is pleased with. If singing is what God's authorized, then friend, listen carefully. I have to participate in singing. You can't sit there like the proverbial lump on the log. You can't sit there and, and just listen and let everybody else do the singing. This is a command of God for His people. If I'm going to worship God correctly, I must sing. I've got to use my voice and with everyone else bring praise to God, sing to one another, speak to one another. Those are not suggestions or good ideas. That's something we've all got to do to be pleasing to God. And so if we're going to worship and song correctly, sing out. You know, we say, well, I don't, got the, I don't have the best voice. Well, we may not be an opera singer, but friend, that's not necessarily what God's looking for. If 
I'm to make melody in my heart. Not only does my voice play a part, but I've got to think through that and be using my mind as well. And that goes up as a sweet smelling savor unto the Lord, according to Hebrews chapter 13, about verses 7 through 18. If I'm going to sing in a way that's pleasing to God, as we just mentioned, you've got to think about and meditate on the words of the song. Sing with the spirit and the understanding. You know, when we sing songs, beautiful songs like the old rugged cross, what are you thinking about? Lunch? What are you thinking about? What you're going to do that evening? No, I want to be thinking about what Jesus did for me. When he sings songs like, How beautiful heaven must be. I want to think about the beauty of that place and, and how that motivates me to want to go there and how thankful to God I am for a plan of salvation that, that makes it possible. And then we mention this, to really be effectively singing. We encourage you to sing as though this is your chance to teach somebody. Colossians 3 verse 16, teaching and admonishing one another. Do you realize when you're singing, other people are listening as well as they sing, and we have the opportunity through that song, through that medium, to teach and admonish one another as they hear the words of that song, as we blend our voices together, as the unison of that great message goes up in praise to God. The words cannot be overlooked. And how powerful they are. And what a great opportunity that is to teach and encourage others. And so today, a fundamental message and a fundamental lesson is in the New Testament God wants us to sing one to another. I understand that under the old law God had used instruments and you find that in the Old Testament. But friend, listen carefully. We've seen clearly We're, that law has been nailed to the cross. We're going to be judged by the words of Christ. We're living in the New Testament age and God's told us Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make melody in your heart to the Lord. Maybe you were raised using a mechanical instrument. Maybe that's what you've done all your life. Maybe that just seems natural in some ways. Friend, we just simply ask you today, does the New Testament authorize that practice? Is that something God has asked us specifically to do? And if not, in the words of Jesus' mother Mary, Whatever Jesus says to you, we've got to be willing to do that. Our encouragement and our hope today is that each of us will turn our attention to the Word of God, be guided by it, and that we'll truly worship God in spirit and truth as He's commanded. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.